Hello everyone this is part 8 of what if Naruto was in Anbu at 6, and I hope you guys enjoy this video and to like, to subscribe, and check out the playlist, to see more comment down below, now let's start the, intro. The air was cold and heavy with tension in the thick morning mist that blanketed the land of Kiri. As one pauses a faint sound, so faint it is almost undetectable by human ears, could be heard through the fog. Several squads of Kiri ninja rushed through the forest, taking both the tree tops and the forest floor. The commanding unit, an Anbu with a blue dolphin mask stopped on one of the branches letting his troops fall on ahead as his second in command landed next to him. He turned to the new arrival signaling him to move on ahead with hand signals. The man nodded before continuing ahead. The commander placed two fingers over the two-way radio on his ear. Command, this is advance unit Alpha We are re, he was cut off as a gauntlet-covered hand wrapped around his throat from behind, cutting off his oxygen and lifting him effortlessly from the ground. He tried to reach behind him to grasp the arm holding him, only to grasp air. Soon enough a sickening crunch was heard along with a bloody gurgle before a body fell to the forest floor with a dull thud. Naruto observed the dead Anbu fall with cold apathy, his blue eyes slowly turned from his limp body to the retreating backs of the Kiri Nin. He raised his two-way radio and spoke into it, waiting for them to step out of his sight. Proceed. Less than three seconds later a great explosion blanketed the forest, where the ninja had vanished, with fire and ash. The harsh wind and dust hit him, ruffling his cloak and hair in the wind. Naruto-sama, are you all right? Came a static-filled voice from he radio. I am returning now, send the patrols. Kill any that survived. A pause. Of course Naruto-sama. Temari sighed as she wiped her brow from the sweat that had formed there due to the heat of the Suna sun. It was abnormally hot today, even by Suna's standards. She glanced at the restaurant down the block and decided to make her way towards it. As she neared voices began making their way toward her, escaping the wooden walls of the stand. She faintly recognized them, it was only a second or so before she entered the stall that she was able to put a face to them. Inside were the five genin of Kanoa. So Sakura, what have you been up to lately? Kiba asked wolfing down some barbecued chicken as he looked to his former teammate. She shrugged. Nothing much, I've been volunteering at the hospital and one of the older medics there, a retired med nin named Chio is helping me learn some new med techniques. Kiba nodded. That's cool. He looked to Chuji, Ino and Shikamaru, what about you guys? Shikamaru shrugged, we've mainly been training with our family scrolls, with one of the Junin that, came with us. He chose his words carefully seeing his teammates hide their respective flinches. Chuji ate some more barbecue as he spoke. Yeah, I've already gotten the hang of two more jutsu. He looked to Ino. How about you Ino? She smiled, while she was still rather subdued in comparison to what she was back in Kanoa, slowly she was regaining her former spunk. I've mastered one and begun to master my, dad's mind scramble technique, he invented it and left some pretty good notes so it's pretty easy. Chuji smiled and nodded as Sakura gave them both a pat on the back, since she was pretty much sitting in between them. Kiba smirked. Yeah, that's cool, my sis has been training with me but since she's the oldest, she's had to take over the clan duties. She's been meeting a lot recently with the Suna council, won't tell me why though. He shrugged as an afterthought. She's been wanting to get you guys a secure Suna citizenship. Temari said from her table across from them. Each of the Kanoa Genin turned to face her. Ha, huh. hey wait you're that Suna chick. Kiba said bluntly making Sakura hit him over the head for his disrespect. Sorry, Temari-san, my teammate here needs a lesson in manners. Sakura said glaring at him from the corner of her eye. Temari waved her off. Cut the formalities. Anyway, like I said your sister's been trying to secure you a Suna citizenship. Why would she do that? Chuji asked swallowing a mouthful of food. Because she knows that if any Kanoa ninja comes searching for you then we'll have no choice but to hand you over. Came a new voice entering the stand making everyone turn to see Gara walking in and sitting down next to Temari. He looked back to them his sea green eyes blank and expressionless. 
As of right now Suna has absolutely no custody over you, and despite the fact that our standing with Kanoa is less than favorable since Orokimaru tricked us into attacking the Leaf during the Chunin exams, harboring you while you do not have Suna's citizenship will work just as well as an open declaration of war and informing him falsely of your whereabouts will allow him a wide opening to spread propaganda against us to the other villages. Should that happen and we would seek an alliance with another village, chances are they won't even touch us if word like that got out. Kiba stood up, glaring angrily at the Kazekage, what? Our parents gave everything they possibly could to get us away from that bastard and you just sell us out if he comes knocking at your door. Calm yourself, Inazuka. Gara spoke to the raging boy. I only said it is a possibility and it is the truth. While I would like to grant you citizenship, I have very little say in the matter since the council are the ones that mainly deal with civilian matters. Kiba glared but huffed and looked away. Of course you have very little say. You're just a genin. Actually, Temari spoke, getting sick of Kiba's attitude. He's going to be taking the title of Kazekage in two weeks. The blood drained from Kiba's face as the entire group of former Leaf Genins glared at him. Shikamaru looked to the Kazekage. So, are you willing to give us the citizenship? Gara took a sip of the herbal tea they had just served him before he spoke. At the moment I am undecided. On one hand, adding the famous Ino Shika Cho clans to our village would be a great asset, as well as the fact that Chio has reported Miss Haruno here having a rather rare talent for medical ninjutsu and the Inazuka clan abilities cannot be underestimated either. All of these could add great strength and prestige to our village. But, Shikamaru continued, you're not sure if you can risk open war over this especially not with this, demon of Kanoa character. Gara nodded silently sipping some more tea. Indeed. He looked to Shikamaru as he spoke again. This, Uzumaki, is not someone I would like to count as one of my enemies. You'd prefer to have him as an ally. Shikamaru stated simply. Gara sipped his tea, his whispered words not reaching anyone but Temari next to him. No, that I would want even less. The Shuji screen door slid open silencing the occupants on the other side as Naruto stepped in. His red eyes scanned the room the scrolls, maps and other documents were littered over a table in the center of the room. Shibi and Shino sat out in the balcony in meditative positions as they listened to the messages their respective hives of Kikaichu relayed back to them and then they relayed the messages to the Chunin couriers who then relayed it to either Kakashi, Kurenai, Hanata, the Kiri woman, Mitsuko Ginchiko, or her second-in-command, Hidetada and then they would relay it to him. That was quite an intricate and, on normal circumstances quite foolish, but this, as many things he did, served a purpose, while Shino and Shibi both had the majority of their respective hives sweeping the enemy's camps and headquarters gathering information, a small portion of each of their hives were crawling around this very base and listening in on conversations the Kiri Nin might be having that would indicate a conspiracy against him. So far, there were only two individuals of any real importance. Ginchiko and Hidetada, the two most powerful of the remaining four swordsmen. If he could eliminate one or the other, then neither would ever really have the strength, politically or physically, to defeat him. He just had to do it, quietly. The other two remaining swordsmen, a man named Guan Suo and his apprentice, an aggressive girl, worthy of Zabuza, named Takibana Mika, were not on good terms with either Ginchiko or Hidetada, and while they did not particularly like his takeover, they were mainly keeping to themselves leaving Ginchiko and Hidetada to conspire and fend for themselves. So, the next order of business, was to eliminate either Ginchiko, or Hidetada. Now then, how to do it? Naruto-sama. The blonde-haired youth turned and found Shibi. The Abarain clan head looked emotionless as usual but by his body language Naruto could tell he was anxious which was alarming in and of itself. What is it Shibi? He spoke rounding in order to face him fully. I believe this information, you may want to hear yourself before it reaches the other's ears. He placed a hand on the blonde's shoulder and leaned in whispering the information into his ear. As Shibi pulled back he could swear Naruto was smirking beneath his mask. Thank you Shibi, you may return to your duty. The Abarain clan head bowed before he turned and left. Naruto turned to one of the Kiri ninja in the room and spoke. You there, bring me Ginchiko, Hidetada, Guan, his apprentice Mika and Hugo Hanata, now. They are needed. The Chunin hastily bowed. Yes Naruto-sama. Before he scurried away. Naruto calmly moved a branch out of his line of sight so he could look out into the small clearing where his targets would pass. Behind him, Ginchiko, Hidetada, Hanata, 
Guan, Mika and Shino, who had requested to join in this mission rested, along with a squad of over 30 Kiri Junin. Guan was a large man, with a large but well-groomed moustache and goatee. He wielded a single, two-edged broadsword. He had a height of about six feet, wore green battle robes with steel chest armor over it, which was painted green and engraved with gold flame-like designs. He had long black hair which was held in a top knot. His apprentice Mika was the exact opposite, whereas his appearance could be considered a large tiger, hers was a small swan. She couldn't be any bigger than 5'3", rather lithe and agile looking. She wore a blue shirt which left her belly exposed, her pants were also blue and somewhat baggy. Two swords were on either side of her waist. They resembled a cross between a samurai sword and a western-style rapier. She was built for speed not power. She had silver flowing hair and red eyes, which only hinted at the crazed bloodlust beneath the serene exterior. Alright Uzumaki, what's the big idea dragging us out here without even an explanation? Hidetada spoke, his expression showing his annoyance and resentment for the young man that called himself his commander. Naruto let the branch fall back to its natural position as he turned to the ninja. He once again let his eyes scan over the group before he spoke. It has recently become known to me that the Mizukage has grown alarmed with the number of ninja he has lost over the last 14 days, therefore he has decided to go and request Kumo for aid in disposing of you. He will be passing by this route with a team 30 to 40 Anbu as his personal guard. We are here to make sure he does not reach his destination. 30 to 40 Anbu, the coward would leave his people naked and unguarded. Guan spoke from his place on one of the tree branches. Shino adjusted his glasses into place, while he had no delusions that he could take on a fully trained Anbu head-on, his role was much more support than anything. His Kikaichu were already on two of the Anbu that were approaching and were already absorbing minuscule amounts of chakra, by the time they actually arrived those two Anbu would have already lost one fifteenth of their chakra by his estimation. The rest of his hive was here with him, ready to be unleashed once the battle began. What is the plan? The plan is simple, we will divide the troops in two groups of 15. Hanata, and Mika will lead one, while Guan and Shino led another. You will herd the Mizukage in my direction, where Ginchiko, Hidetada and myself will ambush him. The two aforementioned members of the Seven Swordsmen exchanged a glance which clearly said. This is our chance. Of course, that would be so much easier if he wasn't planning the downfall as well. He spared a glance to Shino and Hanata and then to a hidden spot in the forest where Kakashi and Kuranai were hiding under his orders. The two of them were to guard both Hanata and Shino respectively. They were only to interfere if they truly believed one of them was about to die, while he couldn't afford to have either one of them die, he also couldn't afford to have them appear as if they needed babysitting. Kakashi had reported that the training he had given Hanata throughout the two weeks he had given her before he undertook this mission that she was at a level of mid chunin without the Byakugan, with it, she was high chunin to possibly even low chunin. Shino's physical abilities placed him to low chunin already with his intellect added to it, he was probably mid chunin, but he couldn't be sure. Guan was easily above both of them in skill, his apprentice Mika however, from what he could sense was relatively at the same level, but, from the reports of her blood crazed induced state when she entered a battle could make her very unpredictable thus, very dangerous. Hanata spoke. But, how can you be certain the Mizukage will flee instead of fight? If the first group attacks and the Mizukage decides to fight them himself then the first group will easily be destroyed. From the reports I've received, the Mizukage is not one for bravery or camaraderie, the chances that he choose to fight the first group head-on, especially an ambush, are much lower than the chance that he will instead attempt to flee towards either safety or to the borders of Kumo, either way we will manage to catch him, or reduce his forces significantly. His eyes snapped towards Hidetada and Ginchiko as the two again shared a look. You have your orders. Get to your positions. Sunad silently sat in the corner of her hotel room, Sake bottle firmly in hand her thoughts were in turmoil, and had been so for the past few days or so. Jiraiya's words still echoed in her mind. No matter how many treaties, agreements, alliances and policies we make, they are, a fragile alliance at best, which breaks almost every two decades and more innocents are lost. But this, this is something that can bring peace for far longer than just some signed treaty. His argument had merit, it was true that no matter how many peace agreements and signings the villages made between each other, this spiral of war was never ending. But, could he do it? Could he truly bring peace to the world? It was, a dream at best, and a delusion at worst. 
And even if he could, just how many more people would he have to destroy in order to do so? How many deaths can be justified with this ambition? Hundreds. Thousands. Millions. And what if he failed, would it all have been for nothing? Would all the rivers of blood and tears all be for a simple delusion that would simply throw this chaotic world into an even darker abyss of death and war? What justification could he have then? Just think of it sooner, no one will ever again have to go through what you went through with Nawaki and Dan. Her former teammate's words again reached her and she scowled remembering how much both herself and her parents had cried when Nawaki died and then the feeling of cold solitude when Dan had left. It hadn't been fair and she grew to hate the world for it. Could she save others from such a thing if she did this? Sunad Sama, a hesitant voice reached her ears. What are you doing sitting in the dark? Sunad was snapped out of her thoughts at the second sentence. It's dark. She questioned as she blinked noticing that indeed the sun had already gone down bathing the room in its inky blackness. Akina stood at the doorway with some groceries in hand. Where's Shizun? Sunid questioned as the girl closed the door with her foot. The young blonde shrugged. Don't know, we were on our way up here when she suddenly handed me everything and mumbled something about leading some debt collectors away. Sunid blushed slightly realizing that Shizun had, again, saved her from the debt collectors. She watched as the blonde girl placed the overstuffed bag on the table and began putting things inside of the mini fridge. She had recovered remarkably well from her injuries throughout the last month or so since they found her and these last two weeks now Shizun often times had to go and find her to make sure she didn't strain herself too much while training. After a few moments Akina began to notice the tense aura surrounding Sunid and turned to face her. Is something wrong? She asked genuinely curious with even what was considered a hint of worry in her voice. Sunid was quiet for a moment before she finally stated. I spoke to Jiraiya a while back. The younger girl tensed, her back going ramrod straight as she turned to face her. Her expression was hesitant and worried, since she didn't know exactly what to say she merely kept quiet, waiting for Sunid to continue. Seeing that she wouldn't speak Sunid decided to continue. He came to offer me a place in Kanoa again. The young girl turned her gaze away from the last Sanon, she leaned over the table, I, see, she said uncertainly. After a moment she seemed to gather herself, her hunched form straightening out as she once again turned to face the slug princess, will you, will you accept? She bit her lower lip slightly as she waited for Sunid's answer. Sunid drank some more sake, leaned back in her chair and looked at her dead in the eye. What will you do if I say I will? Guan sat in a tree, holding his broadsword across his chest as he waited, half-heartedly tracing a stone over the edges. Shino sat nearby, focusing his chakra and preparing his kikaichu for battle. Guan looked at the young Avaraim, as if sizing him up finally after a moment or so he spoke. I have heard, that you volunteered for this mission young Genon. He stated evenly. Shino turned his head to face him. Yes I did. Guan made a, HN, sound as he traced the stone over his sword again, why would a Genon such as yourself volunteer for a mission like this, it would be considered suicidal. So either you are very arrogant or have another reason altogether for doing this. Shino pushed his sunglasses back into position before speaking. Indeed I did, but my reasons are my own and are no concern of yours, with all due respect. He added as an afterthought. Guan smirked. Indeed it is not. Very well then Genon, keep your secrets. For the battle is about to begin. As he spoke he stood and examined his sword. Shino looked to the distance and indeed noticed faint movement beyond the trees. It looks as if they've arrived. Hanata sighed tiredly, if a bit irritated as Mika's cheerful humming continued to reach her ears, thus grating on her nerves and thinning patience. She turned her head to the girl letting her irritation clearly show on her face. Will you cut that out? She snapped after a second or two. It's annoying. Mika let her hand trace over the bark of the tree she was standing on before turning her blood red eyes onto the Huga clan head. Oh so my singing is annoying to you is it? She smiled, somewhere between a friendly smile and a malicious one. She unsheathed one of her swords and pointed it at her throat. Well guess what, your pretty little face and stupid white eyes are annoying me. So how about I carve those out? After all, you are the only leaf ninja here, I could easily kill you and then say that you died in battle. From his place in a nearby tree Kakashi let his eyes travel to his young student. I wonder if you can handle this Hanata. Hanata for her part did realize the precarious situation she was in especially when she heard the mutters that spread through the rest of the ninja in their company. 
She caught a sliver of movement from the corner of her eye. She flared her Byakugan for a moment and caught sight of their targets approaching them. She deactivated her bloodline and looked at the silver-haired girl her face betraying no expression. We don't have time for this. We have plenty of time Miss Hugo Heiress. Mika replied her smile growing as she took a step forward. Hanata stomped down the urge to step back and held her ground stubbornly. Glaring at the girl she spoke again her voice cold and clipped. Our targets are approaching, so either make your move you stupid Kiri bitch, or back off. The tension between the two at that moment grew so heavy and thick that one could cut it with a blunt knife. From his perch in the tree Kakashi raised both eyebrows in surprise. Either she's got a death wish, or she is officially the luckiest person on earth. Finally after almost a full minute of the glaring contest Mika smirked and lowered her weapon. Fine then leaf bitch, I'll deal with you later. Just as she finished speaking the allied group of Kiri Ninja of the other team could be heard as their battle cries reached their ears. Hanata and Akina shared a glance before both leapt away. Naruto observed as the two teams engaged the Mizukage's escort group. But, what none of the Kiri Ninja knew was that it wasn't 30 Anbu the Mizukage had brought with him, but 45. The Mizukage figured that there was a leak in their information network, so in an attempt to lure the leaders of the rebellion, namely, Ginchiko, Hidetada or Guan into a trap he spread information that he would be leaving Takuma with an entourage of 30 men, and then informed his most loyal Anbu to take another team to hang back and only strike when he confronted either Guan, Hidetada or Ginchiko personally. Even now he could sense them at the edges of his perceptions, they were indeed masters of silent killing. So all he needed to do was wait for the Mizukage to retreat. The Mixukage's plan was to lure whoever was leading the attack away from the main group and then ambush him or her with the 15 or so Anbu. The 15 Anbu that would descend on Ginchiko and Hidetada, if all went well. Right on cue he saw the blue-robed figure break through one of the lines and rush into the forest apparently panicked. He spoke into his radio. Ginchiko, he is heading in your direction, Hidetada head to Ginchiko's position, we will ambush him there. Copy. Very well. Naruto put his radio away and rushed after the mukage. Breakthrough. We must protect Yondime Sama. One of the Kiri Anbu yelled as he moved to rush after the Mizukage, before he could leap however a green blur flashed before his eyes before a terrible burning pain tore through his stomach and he hit the floor, his vision fading into cold darkness. The other Anbu all skidded to a stop as the looming form of Guan stood before them, his large broadsword glinting in the light, crimson liquid running down the edge, dripping, drops which fell to the grassy floor, staining the earth. Not one soul shall pass here. He raised his sword and stabbed it hilt deep into the earth, forming a line pulling it back out he spun it once over his head before swinging it over the earth directly in front of him. Huge spears of mud exploded from the ground and impaled two of the ninja that were caught off guard by the maneuver while the others leapt back, avoiding the assault. He leveled his blade at them. Those who dare, shall meet death. Kakashi watched as Hanata was cornered by two of the Kiri Anbu he was ready to step in at a moment's notice but his orders were specifically to interfere only if it was absolutely necessary, besides, she had been handling herself remarkably well using hit and run tactics and long range kunai throwing to injure and weaken some of the opposing nins. Her Jukan had even caught one of them completely off guard, catching him in the right lung and effectively, well, killing him really. He was wondering how she was going to get out of this one. Hey look at this one Ujimasa, it's just a kid. One of them laughed as he looked at his partner. I bet she'll kick your ass eh? The other one, Ujimasa, sneered at his partner. Fuck you Kojiro. As he spoke he stepped forward, ready to run the Hugo heiress through with his Anbu blade. Hanata smirked before she began spinning. K-A-I-T-E-N. What? One of the Anbu yelled before the spinning barrier hit them both pushing him away with great force, they both skidded to a stop as Hanata ceased her spinning, they scrambled to their feet both thoroughly pissed. Now Hanata was worried, that was a delay tactic and she knew it, there was no way in hell she could beat two Anbu head on, hell there was no way she could beat one head on. She had to find a way out of this. Alas, her worrying was for naught, as the two Anbu began to stand, two wickedly curved blades impaled both of them. Entering through the back of their neck and coming out through the front. Hanata looked to her savior and found Mika, with a twisted smile on her face and madness shining in her red eyes. He he he, I told you we'd settle this later, princess. Hanata, though worried, again refused to show it. Instead she smirked. Do you really think you can beat me? 
I f so, then you're dumber than you look. Mika licked some of the blood off of her swords and laughed. Hmm, we'll just have to find out then, won't we? Before Hanata could say anything else, the Kirikanoiki rushed forward swinging her swords in an attempt to cleave her in half. Hanata leaped up, and over her, somersaulting, she landed behind the silver-haired girl and turned on her heel, ready to use a jukan strike to her spine. Mika swiveled around, on her heel and swatted her hand away with her left forearm and then swung at her midsection with the sword in her right hand. Hanata backpedaled, narrowly avoiding the attack. As soon as her feet touched the floor again however, her Byakugan flared to life, the veins around her eyes became more exposed as she naturally settled herself into the Jukan stance. She was going to set this lunatic straight right now. The Mazukage was rushing through the trees of the forest surrounding Kiri, as he leapt for another tree branch he barely managed to twist himself in mid-air in time as a surge of lightning passed right next to him. He growled as he stuck upside down to a branch using chakra. He looked to the forest floor and smirked as he saw his attacker. Ginchiko, he spoke her name with a sneering tone as the white-robed Kanoiki leveled one of her blades at him. Yondime Sama, she spoke in a calm tone as yellow streaks of lightning danced over her two short swords. Foolish girl, why don't you step aside and let me pass? You know you could never defeat me on your own. And who says she's by herself? A voice spoke up to his right as Hidetada emerged from behind a tree. The Mazukage's eyes narrowed at the sight of another one of his hated enemies. Ah, Hidetada, now all of us are here. Not quite. Ginchiko spoke up. Our other friend has yet to arrive. Hidetada finished. The Mazukage snorted. You mean Guan, that imbecile is still fighting the fools I left behind in the clearing, he won't be coming. Oh we're not talking about Guan. Hidetada said calmly before he looked to the right. Ah, here he comes now. The Mazukage snapped his head in the same direction, watching as a red-robed figure appeared from the shadows of the forests. And who would this be? He sneered at the unexpected arrival before finally catching sight of the leaf headband on his arm. Kanoa, he breathed in an astonished voice, before snapping his head back to Ginchiko. You got help from Kanoa. Ginchiko smirked at his shocked expression. Indeed we did you worthless cunt, and now is the time you die. His lips curled back in a snarl. No, Ginchiko, this is where you die. He raised his hand and brought it down and the fifteen hidden Anbu leapt down to the forest floor five of them surrounding Ginchiko, five of them surrounding Naruto and five surrounding Hidetada, surprising two of the three. Welcome to your funeral. Beneath his hood and mask, Naruto's smile was lost. Jiraiya slowly parted the blinds over the entrance to the bar as he entered. He didn't pause to spare any of the patrons a second glance, instead choosing to head directly for the person he had come to see. Soon had let her eyes follow him as he entered, her cup pausing on its path to her lips as she waited for him to join her. Finally, as he loomed over her, he spoke. Have you made your decision? She placed the cup down on the table, calmly ordering the bill before she spoke. Yes. And. A pause before finally. I'll meet with him. Ginchiko and Hidetada immediately took up their fighting stances as the Anbu surrounded them, surprise was evident on their features. Naruto too, acted surprised so as not to arouse suspicion from the two swordsmen, unsheathing his two scimitars and taking up a defensive fighting stance. The Mizukage laughed at their plight before looking at his Anbu captain. Finish them. And just like that the area exploded into action. Naruto stepped to the side to avoid the sword lunge the Anbu behind him attempted, and resisted the urge to just kill him outright. He had to use non-lethal blows until one or both of his missed, allies, were killed, that would be difficult, after all, instinct was a rather troublesome thing to resist. Instead he swiveled around on his heel and bashed the ninja in the face with the butt of his sword, shattering the porcelain mask. The Anbu in front of him attempted a horizontal swing to his neck. Naruto batted the blade away with one of his scimitars, opening the Anbu's guard and delivering a solid kick which sent him flying back. He used his other scimitar to block a strike from behind, twisting his arm over his head as he spun around, keeping the blade in place. Once he had fully turned he used his second blade, and stabbed the man in the foot, causing him to scream in pain and drop the sword. Naruto pushed in until his sword had not only completely gone through his foot, but dug in about five inches into the earth. Ignoring the man's cries of pain Naruto left his blade in his foot and turned, catching another sword in his gauntlet. He pulled him in, and used that sword to block another Anbu's downward swing. 
the Anbu pulled back his blade and attempted a thrust at Naruto's stomach. But was stopped as the blonde kicked him in the face, and then kicked the other man whose sword he was holding with the same foot in the chest. He used the momentum of his second kick, to lean back, grab the sword he had left in the other man's foot, and flip over it. He pulled the blade out and leapt up to the trees as the Anbu were beginning to get their wits back as they chased after him. As he ran Naruto realized something. If I can lure them away then I can kill them without Ginchiko or Hidetada realizing it. Then I can return and step in at my leisure. With his plan set, he sheathed his two blades and rushed through the forest. Meanwhile back on the battlefield, Hanata was not having a good time. The Kirikanoiki was faster than her, her movements wild and untamed in her crazed state, giving her a definite edge over the Hyuga girl. But the Jukan, a naturally defensive fighting style and her Byakugan were keeping her in the fight. She took out two kunai and began blocking and or dodging the other girl's strikes. She swerved, ducked and swiveled as she avoided the blows, pushing her reflexes and speed to her limits. She blocked an overhead swing and pushed it over her head. She tried to use her other kunai to stab the girl. Mika avoided it by moving slightly to the side. She then kicked the Hyuga girl in the stomach, sending her stumbling back until she hit a tree. Hanata recovered in time to place her foot against the tree she hit and use it to leap over Mika as she lunged at her, stabbing one of her swords into the tree. Hanata, not wanting her to gain her second blade again threw her two kunai while still in mid-air, making the girl step aside, leaving her sword in the tree. When the Hyuga heiress landed she drew a single kunai and took to the offensive. She came in with a quick swipe with her kunai, which was blocked easily by the girl's remaining sword. Hanata followed up the attack with three fast Jukan strikes, one to the girl's stomach and two to her chest. If Hanata was expecting some kind of reaction it was not what she received. Mika smirked as she coughed up blood, for a moment Hanata truly thought her to be utterly insane, but to the girl's surprise she reared her free hand back, where she caught the barest reflection of light. Ninja wire, but what did she, the sword? Just as the thought entered her mind the sight of the blade entered the visual range of her Byakugan, the deadly, glinting edge poised to impale her through the chest. It was coming in too fast to dodge. K-A-I-T-E-N. The Hyuga Eris yelled spinning around as the cyclone of energy exploded outwards, sending both the incoming blade and the Kiri Kanoiki flying. From his place in a nearby tree Kakashi was very impressed by his student. She knows how to think on her feet, sometimes in the heat of things you forget your abilities, she's managed to keep a level head throughout the whole thing, very impressive Hanata. As the Hyuga heiress ceased her spinning she barely managed to catch sight of the Kiri Kanoiki before she turned into a puddle of water. Mizu Bushin, but when did she? Mika's form entered visual range of her Byakugan as the girl leapt down from a tree branch above her, her sword raised ready to make the killing blow. Hanata turned in time to catch the girl's wrists as she dived. The Hyuga fell on her back and lifted her legs, placing them on the girl's stomach and, well, kicked, sending the girl clear over her head. Hanata flipped back, her legs now straddling the girl's waist as she lifted her hand, and sent a Jukan strike toward her heart. Mika's smile never faltered and Hanata suddenly found a kunai moving to her chest, towards her own heart. Suddenly the two found their arms held back from killing each other, Hanata's baiguan as the large man held her small wrist with his larger hand while Mika hand her arm held back by a certain abaram as his foot pressed against her forearm. That's enough. Guan's deep rumbling voice stilled the two women before he looked to Shino, I will take them to the medics and keep an eye on them, you will accompany me. Copycat, you and the Genjutsu woman, deal with the mop-up. Kakashi looked momentarily taken aback but let himself drop from the tree as Guan hefted his apprentice to her feet and began making his way to the medics, Hanata and Shino following closely behind. Shino looked at Hanata as she breathed heavily, the adrenaline in her system dying down as the rush faded and her exhaustion made itself known. You handled yourself well, Hanata-sama. The girl jumped slightly at his voice but turned and smiled. Thanks, you cut it a little close though. She said with a mock glare. Shino smirked a little before he turned his eyes ahead once again. Meanwhile Naruto was swiftly rushing through the trees as five shadows moved after him, he slowed his pace, allowing them to overtake him and catch up, even the fool whose foot he had stabbed, though limping, also caught up. Finally, as he made another leap, one of the Anbu made his move, their paths would intercept in mid-air. Naruto caught his wrist, stopping him mid-swing and punched him hard, sending him down to he forest floor as he continued his run. Another Anbu attacked, 
this time, coming directly at him instead of a sideward angle. Naruto realized that he hoped to stab him as he landed on the next tree branch. It may have worked, if he was anyone else. Using some of his wind chakra to adjust his altitude he was now beneath the branch, so instead of landing on the branch he swung under it, bringing his feet up in a straight rise, he kicked the man in the stomach just as he passed over, knocking the wind right out of him, Naruto released the branch and manipulated his wind chakra to keep moving upwards as he repeatedly kicked the man in the guts. He then used chakra to stick to the man and literally walked around him and then used him as a platform to leap even higher just as another Anbu came in with a high kick to the area he had once been. However, due to the absence of his presence the kick connected with the unfortunate Anbu's face, the same one he'd been using as a stepping stool, sending him upwards, towards Naruto. The a sphere of spinning chakra formed in his hand before he slammed it into the man's back, eliciting a cry of pain from him as his insides were twisted and shredded to bits as he was sent careening down to the forest floor where he hit with a loud crash and great dust cloud. Naruto didn't have time to enjoy his victory before he had to twist himself in mid-air, as he blocked another Anbu swipe with kunai. He grabbed the man's forearm, used wind chakra to spin around and sent him crashing into another Anbu about to lunge at him. He continued moving even after he let him go and kicked the fourth Anbu away before replacing himself with him, letting the man get impaled by the last Anbu's blade. Two down. He turned, facing the three remaining Anbu, they each tensed, knowing just by how he had dispatched two of their comrades that he was indeed someone to be wary of. Naruto unsheathed one of his blades the sword glinting in the sunlight, the edges holding a dull red hue, almost as if it was formed by the dried blood of he countless victims that had fallen to its deadly edge. He fell into his familiar stance, the sound of his breathing, hollow and mechanical sounding due to his face mask, sent shivers down their spines. The remaining Anbu, one with a sword, the other two with kunai each spread out surrounding him in a triangle as they took up their stances. Do you guys need some help? Came a voice from above the trees the four ninja looked up to find two more missed Anbu standing above them. Taro, Masaru what are you doing here? Mizukage Sama and the others have the situation under control. Mizukage Sama sent us to see if you needed backup. One of the Anbu spoke as he looked around, seeing the two dead corpses of his comrades. Apparently you do. If you fools choose to fight, then you will surely die, this will be my only offer join me, or suffer the consequences of your resistance. Naruto spoke from his place, making one of the Anbu scoff. Yeah right, you may have caught us off guard before but now that we're prepared and Taro and Masaru are here to help us, we'll kill you easily. The Anbu with the sword sneered at the blonde before he vanished, using speed that was very impressive, even by Anbu standards as he reappeared a few feet behind the blonde. He smirked in satisfaction as he turned, expecting to see the Kanoa Nin shaking in fear, but was instead rewarded by his sword splitting in half, as if it had been cut. He actually cut the sword. But, I never even saw him move. So be it. Naruto's voice brought the startled Anbu out of their shock. Since you worthless fools are so eager to throw your lives away. He spoke as he unsheathed his second blade as blue chakra began to seep from him, before it exploded in a bright pillar of blue like flames. One of the Anbu that had just arrived swiftly unsheathed his sword before rushing at the blonde the other four following his example after just a moment of hesitation. Naruto leapt high into the air, going above the tree line in a single leap. The first Anbu wearing a sparrow's mask caught up, his sword raised over his head, ready to bring it down on the Kanoa Jinchuriki. The next thing he knew the blonde had punched him square in the face without even turning to face him and he was plummeting back down to the forest floor. The second, wearing a panther's mask followed suit, leaping from one of the trees, he lunged at the Jinchuriki, rearing his blade back before he thrust, only to have the Kanoa Nin somehow flip over his attack. Naruto manipulated his wind chakra to right himself before he delivered a powerful, crushing axe kick which connected at the man's right collarbone. A silent scream of pain came from his mouth as he plummeted down to the forest floor, joining his comrade. The next one, wearing a lizard's mask was next. Naruto simply vanished from his location, reappearing behind the man and then used him to jump a bit higher, letting him take the blow of the bear-masked Anbu that tried to deliver a haymaker from behind. The bear-masked Anbu looked up in time to get stomped in the face by the Jinchuriki, sending both him, and his lizard-masked partner down. On the way, his kunai pouch opened scattering the metallic projectiles all around the descending blonde. The last Anbu wearing a boar's mask never even had a chance. 
When he was in striking distance the blonde replaced himself with one of the scattered kunai. She turned to face him and threw one of her own kunai, only to have him replace himself again, he turned and barely had time to catch a glimpse of red and black before he vanished again. The blonde vanished and reappeared so quickly it looked as if he was everywhere as he didn't even use the smoke clouds. In the end, the boar-masked individual was so dizzy she couldn't even put her guard up as the blonde reappeared in front of her, slightly higher than where she was before he delivered another axe kick sending her also crashing into the forest floor. Naruto descended, breaking through the tree line. Not a moment after he did though the sparrow-masked Anbu lunged at him again. Naruto twisted himself in mid-air, dodging the man's lunge. Apparently he was trying to simply shoot past him as he cut him, but Naruto had other plans as he caught the man's ankle and pulled him back. He felt the air leave the sparrow masked Anbu's lungs as he punched him in the stomach. Hard. The man coughed and wheezed as he tried to force air back into his chest. The blonde showed no mercy as he delivered an uppercut followed by the blonde manipulating his wind chakra to do a front flip in mid-air and then delivering another downward kick to the man's head sending him head first down to the forest floor. Again he felt the panther masked Anbu's presence, the lizard masked Anbu also approached him from the other side. He turned and backhanded the panther masked Anbu sending him flying and then simply placed his foot, letting the lizard masked Anbu's face connect on its own as the man couldn't move to stop his own momentum. The bear masked Anbu tried to jump down from one of the trees in order to catch the blonde by surprise. But the blonde again manipulated his wind chakra and moved out of the way, letting the bear-masked Anbu strike the disoriented lizard Anbu who was in a simple free fall, sending him down to join the still wheezing sparrow. Naruto then put both hands together, his sword still firmly in his grip before he brought him down and hit the bear-masked Anbu in the back of the neck with a sickening snap. Naruto spread out his arms, his two swords igniting with his two chakra elements as he raised them and swung down. Gokaku Sotsu. Hell's tormenting flames, he yelled as both flame and wind mixed and exploded, blanketing the forest floor in fire. The three Anbu barely had time to scream. Noo. A scream came to his right as the boar masked Anbu rushed him, intent on avenging her comrades. Naruto stood on the tree branch, the embers of the roaring flames slightly lifting the shadows that veiled his face, making the Anbu freeze as she met the gaze of her opponent. Those cold sea blue eyes empty and void of all emotion. Eyes of a machine, one that had killed thousands and caused suffering to millions. Eyes of something, much worse than any demon. What monstrosity are you? Was her whisper before the demon of Kanoa struck, his scimitar impaling the Kiri ninja straight through the stomach. She gasped and coughed as he clutched the blade, hoping to stop it from going in further. No such luck the blonde suddenly pulled up, opening the woman's navel, blood gushed out like a fountain as she gasped and fell forward. The blonde removed his blade, turned and left her to bleed out, intent on finding the last Anbu. He found the sparrow-masked individual, picking himself up, apparently, his last flight through the trees had broken his arm sprained an ankle and probably broken a rib or two. Naruto walked forward and scented the fear rolling off the individual in waves as he began dragging himself back as fast as he could. Pathetic. The blonde inwardly sneered before he knelt down and grabbed the man by his throat, lifting him up and slamming him against the tree. Shifted the sword in his grip and ready to deliver the final blow. Plea. The plea was cut off harshly as his sword cut through the man's throat. Naruto pulled the blade out and resheathed it. He watched as the man's lifeblood seeped out of him. He gurgled a few times before he finally slumped over, dead. The blonde turned and left heading back to the two, allies, he had left behind. That will be it for this video if you want more comment down below, like, subscribe. And see you guys later.